Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the latest webinar from the IMEC -E on the energy transition. I'm Steve Cromer. I'm chair of the Upstream Oil and Gas Committee. Uh, I'm now retired from ConocoPhillips. I was chief engineer in well operations there. Now, today we're going to try and address how some localized successes, and that be in the UK, can be used to influence the global community towards net zero. Um, the Skidmore report was really interesting, it, uh, focused on reducing the UK emissions to net zero, but the UK's emissions is currently about 2% of global greenhouse gases. So we need to make a bigger impact, but what we can do is take some of the really good work that's been done in the UK and put that to a global. So that's what this is going to try to address. You may find that this presentation creates more questions than answers. Certainly we're at the uh, start of this uh, energy transition. So to try to address some of that and have a discussion on it, we're going to have a panel session at the end of the uh, presentation by Simon. And uh, we'll be joined by Patrick O'Hara, Willie Tulloch and Simon himself and myself. So for that panel session, if you could uh, put any questions you have on the questions board, um, that would help us get ourselves started on the presentation. So if you do that as you're continuing, as any of the questions come to your mind, uh, pop it on there and we will go through as many as we can towards the end. We should finish about one o'clock today. So without further ado, I will introduce Simon. Uh, Simon Rees is the Director of Digital Engineering at Element Digital Engineering, the modeling, simulation and data science arm of Element Materials Technology. After completing a PhD in fluid dynamics at the University of Leeds and a spell in mathematical modeling at Pinkleton Glass, he began a varied career consulting in the power and energy sector. He's been active in oil and gas, conventional, nuclear, renewable, uh, and was recently in the challenges posed by the energy transition. He's a former chair of the Upstream Oil and Gas Committee, a fellow of the Institution of Mechanical Engineers, a member of the Royal Institution of Naval Architects, and a fellow of the Royal Society of Arts. Simon, are you in there? Yes. Uh, Excellent. Me. Yes, thank you, Steve. Thank you very much. Right, uh, well, um, you can see the title of the presentation there, How Can Localised Successes Be Used to Influence the Global Community Towards Net Zero? And I have to say that I can't take credit for, for these slides. Um, it's a very much a team effort by the community within the, the Upstream Oil and Gas Committee and, and, and others. Uh, so it's a, it's a collection of thoughts and views, um, quite a few facts and bits of information in there. Parts of it you might find a little bit controversial, which would be good. It'd be uh, nice to uh, stimulate a little bit of discussion. Um, and my contribution uh, was largely, <laughs> largely limited to correcting some typos, but I have added a few extra little factoids, which I think you might find interesting. So the Skidmore Report, which, uh, which Steve alluded to, uh, came out earlier this year. It uh, talks about Mission Zero, and it's got four main aspects in there. It tries to build an, uh, uh, an economic case or a, a process by which there could be an economic case for saying that net zero could be a positive economic uh, development for the UK. It's an opportunity, not a cost, essentially. And it's got four major, three major questions. What's the most pro-business, pro-growth and economically efficient path towards meeting net zero? How to maximize those economic opportunities to generate jobs, innovation, things like that? And what are the costs and benefits for some of these new technologies and policies? There were four categories of um, uh, actions that he, that he broke down. There were an awful lot of detailed actions. If you haven't read the report, the introduction gives a good summary. The report itself is several hundred pages long. There are a lot of detailed actions in there, but they fall into four broad categories. Uh, backing business about the incentives, uh, whether it's by the tax system, via um, direct investment, things like that, how to grow green. So getting business to actually do the bulk of the work here. Backing local action. And this means down at the sort of regional level or below in the UK, so down to city level, looking at how individual communities can move towards net zero in the, in the 2050 timescale. Developing energy efficient homes. Only 22% of the UK's energy is actually carried by the grid. About 40% is carried as the gas network and most of that goes to heating houses. So how can that be improved? 
and using infrastructure to unlock net zero, what else needs to be done, whether it's the gas network, carbon storage, electrical grid improvements, things like that. What other things need to be done in order to unlock net zero? As Steve said, the UK is a very minor contribution, a um, couple of percent, maybe tops. Um, and that, that shows the historic trend from, from 1850. You can, you can integrate that up yourselves. And uh, if you do, you'll find that the UK comes, I think, eighth or ninth in the terms of global contributor. United States and China are very much greater, with China, as you can see, going up quite quickly. However, the influence of the UK is quite great. We are quite a major player in various energy industries and energy technologies. And also the, the targets that the UK has set for net zero by 2050 are some of the most ambitious in the world. So we are well positioned to actually influence how things develop from here on. And the fact that we have that relatively short term target means we should be getting ahead of some other, other nations and exploring some more technologies. So one of the objectives of this webinar, objectives, let me get to that, there we go. Right, um, how to meet these local targets and really the, the, the fundamental thing is how do we use the IMEC's global reputation and expertise the community of people that are here watching this to influence the path to net zero there's a lot of debate going on there are lots of different technologies crucially important is of course the fact that technologies move faster than, than, than people realize and uh, there's a couple of examples that we'll, we'll touch on later on but technologies move very very quickly faster than legislatures in particular can, can cope with so this community is quite key for, for steering that. So how, how can we influence engineers? How can we identify the right technologies? That's really difficult, as we'll, as we'll see. And how can we make sure that any new technologies are actually the most commercially attractive and the best of, um, use of investment and time? And this is the first of a series of seminars. I think that's one's the 9th of July. And these will address all the different aspects of these problems. The local issues can give global problems and the Ukraine war is, is uh, has caused big changes in the, the UK supply chain. In 2018 over 30 percent of the UK's of Europe's gas came from Russia with LNG quite a small contributor down there. That's changed massively. Russia's now pretty much dropped at the bottom of the chart with LNG now a very significant contributor. However LNG is about 10 times worse in terms of CO2 emission than uh, natural gas. And that's because of the cost of compression, the energy that's lost in that, you can recover some of it, but not much. The cost of compression of cooling it, transporting it, means that it actually comes out about 10 times worse, which is a surprising figure for people who don't realize that all this LNG that's coming in from the States is, is not a good thing for CO2. What it does mean, of course, is that UK's produced, unproduced gas is 10 times better so in fact, the environmentally friendly option is to develop the UK's existing offshore fields more aggressively rather than import LNG from offshore. Other countries, of course, aren't quite as picky. Uh, Russian oil imports to China and India have gone up quite sharply. India in particular is importing an awful lot of Russian oil at the moment now at discounted rates too because the, the Russians are keen to offload it. And you can see the effect there. The UK's global contribution to CO2 is so small that it's uh, it's hard to understand why people campaign so hard about the UK when, when we're one of the leading practitioners in carbon reduction. But other people are quite happy to pick up the slack. That actually does affect us, as we'll see later on. In reality, energy supply solutions are a three-way balance between energy security economics and environmental protection. You can have one or the other usually, but uh, not all three at the same time. And the job of policymakers is to try and ensure that we're at the right place in the middle of that triangle where everything's equally balanced. One thing to note is that the economic side of things is usually looked after by the shareholders of a business. So the imperative to make money will ensure that that particular corner of the triangle is always uh, well weighted, uh, plenty of uh, pressures will be on there. The other things generally have to come about for either legislative changes or structural changes to the energy market. And one of the ways in which the UK has tried to do that is by changing the, the economic, but its thumb on the economic scales to try and improve the, the cost benefits of environmental. 
situation. However, in the global environment, we're talking about how we influence the global environment here, that can put us at a bit of a disadvantage. Other countries are not so interested in legislation which will hobble their economies. They will prefer to be weighted towards the economic side of things and away from energy security or environmental concerns. That may not be correct. The UK may be in a position where, as the Skidmore report implies, the economic advantages present in changing to green technologies are actually worth having. Now, some local examples within that triangle. We talk about where you place yourself within that triangle, the balance between the different, different areas. So one thing that's very popular at the moment, moving to heat pumps. Heat pumps are electrically driven, and usually air heat pumps, but it can be ground source heat pumps. They are approximately three times more efficient than gas in terms of energy extraction. So that's a plus of the chance to save money. In addition to that, there is a government scheme which helps subsidize that and reduce the emissions level caused by uh, heating. However, electricity costs approximately four times more than gas per kilowatt hour, so at three times more efficiency, it doesn't compensate, running a heat pump is more expensive. Furthermore, they don't work terribly well in uninsulated homes. Uh, my own home is, uh, dates back to the 18th century, and unfortunately, the heat pump, we've been told, will not work because it's just fundamentally too drafty. So without the other side of the, the uh, economic equation, the cost of uh, insulating the house, the heat pump doesn't actually work as a solution. It's not there on the triangle. Electric cars. Electric cars are the other way around. Electric cars are where the, the economic incentive actually promotes the environmental side of things. There are many fewer moving parts in an electric car. The profit margins made by internal combustion engine driven cars have been actually fairly slim for quite a long time now. Tesla showed that actually on a item, a unit basis, you could make much greater profit from an electric car with fewer moving parts, much simpler design ultimately. Other cat manufacturers saw that and they, but they didn't bother reducing their margins, they sold them a premium, so it cost people more. And at the same time, again, lack of government investment means that there aren't sufficient charging points. But the higher profits are still effectively driving the move to electric cars, much more efficiently than the government pressure, which is actually lagging behind with the lack of investment in electric charging points. So ultimately, it's a system of systems. And to imagine that, you've got to think about what are the various components of the energy network in the UK and beyond the UK. So we have our sources, where the energy comes from, which can be every conceivable source of, of power. We have our uses, whether it's transport, heating, grid electricity, industrial applications. One of those, we have distribution, electrical grid, gas grid, the predominant methods at the moment. And then we have other softer issues, such as finance, how finance comes into play, where the money goes in order to develop the different parts of the system, legislation, how that steers thing, culture, because the cultural pressure to, to move to green technologies is now quite strong. So there are, there are quite a lot of things that need to be taken into account. And some of these vary from area to area. So some parts of the UK have greater access to certain parts of it than others. So it's, it's also a localized system. Some work's been done looking at these things and modeling them. This is a model of the uh, economic, uh, socio-economic uh, policies for grid transition in the island of St. Helena. Now, obviously, St. Helena is quite a small island. It's only got one real endpoint, which is the or, or external industry, which is the industrial, or it's tourism. So most of its energy goes into tourism or just accommodation costs. It's also got quite a simple economic policy. So within that diagram, the blue arrows show the uh, flow of um, causes, things that cause, with positive being a positive thing, and negative being a negative thing, as you can imagine, little things there. There are a number of loops defined as well, which are the sort of different aspects of the economy. So you've got green tourism on the left there. You've got affordable consumable energy at the top, social development, economic, sustainable energy, affordable energy, so it's all very energy and it, uh, focus. And it talks about how the different influences pass between those things. And you can build that up into a system dynamics model that will actually put value in some of these things and show how the energy model works, the financial model works to influence the outcome of the uh, of energy policy. Of course, the UK is a little bit more complicated than that, has a lot more sources, a lot more sinks, a lot more flow paths. But ultimately, you can start building these sorts of models.
of an economy. One interesting fact, of course, we talked about how the rest of the world has been using more hydrocarbons, but we've been using less, but of course we still consume a lot of things. And this practice by which you reduce your carbon by effectively exporting your manufacturing is called carbon leakage. It's the transfer of manufacturing to other countries with lower emission standards. Other countries, of course, are doing things, but more slowly. So China has a target of 2060 by net zero. They see economic benefits. They also see increasing global influence as part of that. So by investing heavily in green technology, that becomes exportable, replaceable, fundable. But their estimated cost of going net zero is $17 trillion. Of course, the Chinese uh, finances are quite opaque, and how much they're spending of that at the moment is not clear. But there's heavy investment. India's gone for net, net zero by 2070. Their per capita emissions aren't anything like America or Europe or increasingly even China, but they're increasing quite sharply. And those are the two big uh, non-UK and Europe carbon producers at the moment. The UK is currently having a consultation on carbon leakage. There's a, there's a link there, but if you, if you don't see it, please just search for it. There's a question there. If you are involved in any sort of industry at all, it talks, it asks you questions about where your carbon might go if you export effectively exporting your carbon to try and get a figure for how much UK uh, carbon is exported. Uh, some research has been done by the University of Sussex that says that UK's domestic carbon production has gone down 40% or over 40%, not 44% since 1990, which is uh, very creditable. However, trade embedded CO2, so this exported CO2, has gone up by 40%. Uh, the number was smaller to start with, so we're still down overall, but the the effect is that we are, if we, are, we are increasing the rate at which we export our CO2 emissions as quickly as we are getting rid of our own. So how do we cope with that? How do we cope with the fact that we're, we are actually exporting an awful lot of CO2? The best way to do it is by expanding our renewable energy generation, especially wind. Solar is actually picking up quite quickly in the UK, but um, we're also not the sunniest of countries. So wind, especially offshore wind and increasingly offshore floating wind, is, is very important as a way of doing that. The National Grid has done this future energy scenarios, looking at how different pathways can be used. Um, and wind is probably going to go within that. And there's currently 28 gigawatts installed. There's up to 130 gigawatts in different stages of planning. And that is considerably more than the UK requires. So there is obviously a surplus there, but on the other hand, the wind doesn't always blow. So storage is going to be incredibly important going, going into the future. And that wind storage balance would at the moment supply the grid requirements. As I said earlier, I said about 22, 22.5% of UK total energy consumption is actually grid. The rest of it goes into transport and it goes into heat. So transport will probably go to electric We've got steady state batteries now being patented, and there's two come out of the US University, one out of the UK University. These, these batteries will give a thousand mile range and they'll be in production by, by the end of the decade, which will also make a lot of lithium gigafactories completely redundant, and that's a, a different issue. But the, the, the transport solution is probably going to be more electric than anything else. Heat, there could be some hydrogen going into the pipeline. There's a plan to have uh, up to 20% hydrogen in the UK grid. It was targeted at 2025, and that's slipped a bit. But uh, beyond that, looking potentially at 100% hydrogen, we also have heat pumps and other, other things coming into play. Hydrogen, however, is not a natural source. You can't go and mine hydrogen. You can't get it out of it. It has to be manufactured using other energy sources. So hydrogen is, is not an energy source. Hydrogen is a storage medium. And ultimately, it's best used on a grid scale rather than for local applications. It can be produced by electrolysis, it can be produced by nuclear thermochemical, it can be stored in salt caverns, it can be stored in uh, disused uh, or in gas caverns. So there are plenty of storage opportunities for hydrogen. It is probably too complex and too efficient for you to use a long term for hydrogen or for heat for transport or for heating. Aerospace will probably move to what's called sustainable aircraft fuels, SAF, that's the big push that way. Uh, land transport will probably move to, to more electric. Heating will probably also go electric. So electrification is key to all of these things. There's numerous different technologies that contribute to that, but the big things that we require to make all this work are going to be electrical grid investment and investment in storage, energy storage. It's really, really important. 
So what's going on in the UK at the moment? Uh, we've got the biggest wind farm in the North Sea at the moment, but um, we didn't actually make the most out of that because most of the manufacturing was done in Sweden, Denmark, Germany, and increasingly China. Uh, it's not where all the wind turbines came from. There, there are a few sites in the UK, but um, we didn't make as much out of it as we should have done, which was uh, which is a shame. And although we are rated at number two in the world for for wind energy, that's really on the production rather than the manufacturing side of things. And there are further challenges now caused by the US inflation reduction rate, which uh, many will have heard of. It's a trillion dollars uh, to go into green technologies and other aspects with the aim of investing cash into the economy particularly around decarbonisation. And that decarbonisation model is much simpler in the UK. So it's only a carbon trading scheme that gives a simple tax break per kilogram of CO2 reduced. So it's, it's essentially a, an offset funding model which works much more efficiently. It's been known that this sort of investment model is resulting in a lot of uh, tech companies moving out to the US because the same funding models apply to things like chip manufacture and other advanced tech. The same rules apply to green technology. Green technology is moving to the States at the moment as a result of this. Doesn't mean nothing's happening at all. This net industry in Wales has got a new manufacturing facility which is on the go now and is looking at massive eight, so let's go for the, uh, for the eight megawatt ones there. Uh, we have existing sites in MIG, the uh, um, offshore energy one, uh, Hull, Newcastle, Isle of Wight, which has been there for quite a few years now. 900 million was invested in UK wind turbine manufacturing in 2021 alone. And in 2021, it was estimated to employ 19,600 people directly. There's a mass of deployment schemes underway. I mentioned uh, we've currently got up to 130 gigawatts of planned installation. That is very loosely planned. That goes all the way out to, yes, we can put something there. Certainly in the near term, there's 50 or 60 gigawatts coming. So there's, there's a lot of, of wind investment happening in the UK at the moment. We've also got the, the new issues around CO2. CO2 was, again, an area where the UK neglected in an early lead, thinking other technologies were going to take part, suddenly got back into it in the last budget, and decided to fund it after all. That has required a whole new framework, legal and commercial framework, to be able to do the whole business that goes around carbon capture. And we have immense natural advantage. We have 75 to 80% of the Europe's entire need for carbon storage for the next 100 odd years. That's plenty to be a number for the time being, and we have the infrastructure in place that allows us to access that. However, there's still work to be done on the specific, particularly shore-based um, equipment that's needed. Teesside is obviously the, the most advanced program in that regard, and there also needs to be a financial and commercial model built that allows you to cost the um, CO2 storage effectively in terms of carbon trading. That still needs to be worked out in more detail. So work going on there on the carbon storage side of things that will allow things to continue. Because we do need things to continue. Now, this is a, a global forecast coming from the US Energy Information Administration. So it's the forecast of the US um, from about 2021. And as you can see, things don't actually change very much. The UK, by 2050, we might be net zero, but the rest of the world is going to carry on regardless. Fast-growing economies in the Far East in particular continue to invest heavily in, in hydrocarbons because it's the cheapest way to do it. If you look on the plot on the left there, you can see the renewables at the top. Well, that's increased from maybe 15% to 25%, but coal is still on the plot in 2050, let alone petroleum and other liquids. And nuclear actually shrinks slightly. So we still have some considerable global challenges to face. Just focusing on the UK alone is not going to do the job. How can the IMECI influence this? This comes back to the, the starting point. As I said, this is the first webinar of a series of webinars that we will explore all of these issues in a little bit more detail. And in particular, how the IMECI as an institution can actually use its knowledge and experience to try and speed things up and influence the global problems that we are facing. There's a limited amount of money out there, 20 billion subsidies for 20 years in the UK. There isn't the workforce in the UK that can deliver all of these things on the time scale that they want, but the UK probably isn't the issue. We can highlight the issues on skills and workforce. Any of us out there who are trying to recruit engineers at the moment know that there's simply not enough out there. So we can highlight those, and it's not just in this industry, it's in all industries. But how do we influence the global debate more effectively? 
So is there an export opportunity for the UK in decarbonisation and carbon capture and storage? Possibly. Some of the work we're doing, could we collaborate with other industries? How can we take the expertise that we hope to develop and develop in that net zero by 2050? How can we export that? And how do we take that out to beyond net zero? Well, that's, that's gone through the slides. As I said, it's been um, a collection of different views, pictures, factoids. The idea that we're trying to put over is the UK may be doing quite well, but we're not really moving the needle on a global scale. The question is, how do we achieve that? Back to you, Steve. Thank you very much, Simon. That was very interesting. Uh, we've got a couple of questions, but uh, if anyone in the audience would like any other questions, Put in front of the panel, we will uh, we will address that. Um, so we'll now assemble the panel. We've got Patrick O'Hara and Willie Tarr joining us. Are you in there, gents? Yes, here. That's Willie. Good. Okay. So the first question, I think it was sort of answered. It was one of the ones that came in a bit early, um, but I think it was answered a wee bit later on. Uh, and it states, I have uh, recently received a document from EDF Energy on how an air source pump can help us move forward. It says air source pumps are three to four times more efficient than gas boilers. I think this shows the level of technical ignorance with which we have to contend. How can we combat this? So I think the subject is about education now. It's a, you know, we all agree that the, the air source heat pump is a is only efficient if you've got a fully insulated home and you get good cheap electricity. Anyway, I think the question is about how do we combat this technical ignorance? Who would like to uh, answer that one? I'll start off if I may. Yes, um, please. Because I think this is this comes back to the. The question asked at the end of the presentation itself, which is how do we as an institution deal with things? And when you look at some of the stuff in the press and uh, online, the, the, the social media world is alive with, frankly, garbage on this topic. I mean, it's very, very rare to see a well thought out media post or anything on, on, this, to on this topic. I think this is exactly where we should be playing as, the, as an institution. You know, we should be making more of the fact that we actually have some expertise on this. I think it's down to us. We need to we need to push back on some of these things. When it comes to to media, that looks like uh, that particular example uh, looks like a selective use of efficiency data, shall we say, putting it politely to to maybe try and convince people to uh, to make a decision. But as an institution, yeah, this is what we should be doing. Totally, absolutely. And so, yeah, the the whole facts need to be put in front of us. But I think the institution really has a job of education. Mm -hmm. uh, Patrick, do you have anything to add to that? I'll just add in there that it, it, it is going to be a challenge with adoption of green technologies, be that electric vehicles or heat pumps, is if people start hearing negative stories from a contacts, friends, a family or in the community of people incurring large extra costs from adopting those technologies, then that will be a major barrier to getting public acceptance of those. I agree. I agree. There's a very, a very good example of that we can talk about in, in a, a minute too. Um, Willie, have you anything more to say? Uh, I guess, uh, well, I would just probably add that, uh, <laughs> well, the, the nature of what we're talking about here is obviously, you know, transition. So that, I guess that's one aspect. And I mean, I, I think where we're at is new is in a, I mean, there's, there's loads of complexities. You could go off in any angle on this, but I think, you know, we're really in a kind of state of flux. And and I guess we'll, you know, we'll reach a point where a lot of these things will sort of iron out, but there's no, um, it's going to be a case of different solutions for different scenarios. I think Simon touched on it, you know, with his, uh, his own residence, you know, it, it's maybe not suitable there. Uh, in other cases, it, it will be suitable. But I think the other thing, and I mean, that that goes for, you know, that's totally scalable as well. I mean, that goes from domestic right up to, you know, heavy industry, uh, where, there's, where there's huge de demand. It's, it's, it's the same thing that applies. Um, but I do think um, 
I, again, I think it's key, this piece on education, there, there's so much information now available at the fingertips of people. Um, and, and we do have, well, let's just say, I, I, I guess, maybe certain um, uh, people driving certain agendas. Uh, and, that, and that's not me arguing one way or another, but but I think it's difficult for people to make clear judgments and, and, and get clear information. And I think that is actually a frustration of the public as well. You know, it's not that they're not accepting things. It's just, well, they want to know much more clearly what to, uh, you know, what it is that they can do or what they need to do and, and what support they can get. I think that's true. You know, to get an unbiased answer at the moment, particularly from politicians who have got their own agenda, you know, they're trying to push one thing or another or just just basically trying to hit targets at any costs, you know, and that cost being financial or uh, environmental costs, you know. Um, yeah. So I think, well, it, it, it's worth, it's actually just, again, uh, not not uh, uh, stimulating any political views here, but the, um, I'm sure you know, Steve, that the Aberdeen Gramp in Chamber of Commerce uh, had their annual energy survey released yesterday. And I guess one of the questions in there was around, well, it was around, uh, you know, the political sphere. Uh, and I think, you know, if you look at that, uh, in terms, th this is businesses responding um, to the, uh, to the survey and i think the vast majority felt that there is no clear understanding or agenda uh, and and they don't necessarily buy into you know what what the uh, i i guess political landscape is and i mean that for me that's kind of disappointing because at the moment we need all stakeholders really well we're looking for guidance and policy from the government uh, to understand direction and i'm not saying it's easy but I think you know better alignment will start to drive um, us in the in the right direction, but it is think, difficult at the moment. Yeah, I think you know we're getting guidance from the government, you know, but who's given the government any guidance? You know, some of these politicians, you know, they're the lawyers, they're you know the career people who really haven't got the sort of engineering background, and I think that's maybe where the I make key. You know, getting back to the question again. You know, how do we stop this? Uh, how, who do we educate? Do we educate politicians? Is it IMEC's job to do that? Is it IMEC's job to sort of try to develop a, an unpolitical uh, basic numbers, facts, you know, things like, you know, three times efficient or four times efficient and uh, give the full story as opposed to just half of it. And I think that's maybe where the IMEC comes in, is trying to trying to be an educator with the full facts rather than a political educator. I think that might work quite well. Yeah, I agree. So we've got another question here, and this is about captured CO2. Um, is there any benefit in compressing captured CO2 and then using the f in the food industry or for cooling systems rather than just storage? And what will happen to the stored CO2? Okay, so has anyone got any uh, enough insight? I know, Simon, you've done some looking at some have, carbon yeah. capture, yeah? Yes, the, the, the answer is yes. It can it can absolutely be used that way, but the demand for it is a fraction of the amount that's being produced, so it, it doesn't help us. One other application is, incidentally, um, artificial protein. It can be it can be used in manufacture of, uh, of artificial protein. So there are other ways in which you can use CO two, but the, the demand uh, doesn't really match uh, the the supply. So it can, it can be it can partially used. What happens? Um, it's super critical when it goes offshore. So it's at uh, very high pressures, low temperatures. It's uh, it's um, it's interesting stuff to put it like that. Uh, so it expands quite rapidly when it goes into the into the reservoirs. The reservoirs that are being used are salt capped usually, so they are impermeable. So it should just stay there until someone taps it out. Other storage methods have been looked at in the States. I think in New York State, there is a program that's looking at converting it to carbonate rock, mm. which uh, will yeah. keep it in solid form. So there are, there are other there are other options for storing it. Yeah, yeah. I've always thought, you know, the, the reverse of that, you get some, uh, some seashells and put some hydrochloric acid on it and that produces co2 you know in reverse mm. 
So, you know, the White Cliffs of Dover is effectively chalk, which is effectively lumps of CO2 in a, in a solid form. But it'd be great to get back to that stage, getting back into the, something like the White Cliffs of Dover. Yeah. But yeah, that's an interesting question. Okay, I've, I've got another question. I think it's coming back down to the first one that we did there. And this is about hydrogen. Um, and you said that hydrogen is very inefficient in certain areas, and that's because it's energy. Um, but there's also some tests being done in Whitby. Does anyone know anything about that, the Whitby hydrogen it's, tests? It's the Whitby Village. The Whitby Village thing, yes. That's what it's called. It's not Whitby in, on the north on the north coast of Yorkshire, it's would be up in uh, uh, it's on the north, it's in Cumbria somewhere, yeah. Is it? Oh, I didn't know there was two of them. Okay. Yeah. It's two of these. yeah. Okay, uh, so there's been a lot of pushback by the residents on this one from what I hear. Yes, they have cancelled. There were two villages that were being used as car as um, hydrogen villages. I uh, can't remember the name of the second one, but uh, would be they put it to a public vote when they were quite way downstream and they uh, they voted against it. And the program was to put in a parallel gas system so it, would, it could run hydrogen uh, into everyone's homes. And the idea was to try, I think it was a 20% trial initially, or maybe 100% trial on the hydrogen. Hydrogen safety is um, dominated by the Hindenburg accident. Everyone has seen the Hindenburg accident and uh, everyone, as a result, is a bit nervous about hydrogen. It is. It has a much wider flammability range than, than other gases. It has a lower ignition energy than other gases. So it, it, it is. It is quite potentially more dangerous than, than, than natural, natural gas. However, it also diffuses faster. So when it leaks, it diffuses more quickly and is less likely to form an explosive cloud. There's an awful lot of work going on at the moment into demonstrating the safety of hydrogen for domestic housing. Um, a lot of the UK's gas grid is old iron pipes. It doesn't seal terribly well. And again, this, this, these aspects are all being looked at. And I think it I think really must take into account that no one is going in and setting up hydrogen without doing an awful lot of safety work, an awful lot of safety mm -hmm. work, mm -hmm. conclusion that it's safe. So I, I think safety is not the issue around hydrogen. It, it is efficiency. Because you, as I said, you can't yep. find it naturally. It's not like natural gas. You've got to make it using electricity. Those electricity losses when you do that. It has lower calorific content than natural, natural gas, so you don't get as much energy as when you burn it. it it's, it's just not a, it's not a terribly efficient fuel, to put it lightly. In my humble opinion, I think we'll go electric and hydrogen will just be used for grid-scale grid storage, where it'll be electrolysis directly from, say, an offshore turbine if it's surplus electricity. And at the moment, Scotland is already dumping surplus wind energy because the grid connectors between Scotland and England, there's only two of them, they've only got a four gigawatt capacity or something like that. Surplus energy is already being dumped from, from Scottish wind farms. If it can be connected directly to offshore electrolyzers, turned into hydrogen, hydrogen pumped into, into disused natural gas reservoirs, that's a much more efficient way of doing it, in my humble opinion, than, than regenerating the wind stops below. Excellent. I would be inclined to agree with you on that one. The, the, a volumetric energy density of hydrogen is really poor and the the, the actual challenges f faced by our a gas transmission system in actually trying to replace a natural gas with hydrogen are uh, extreme yeah so why is the government doing it then you know they're not listening to <laughs> That's a good question. We're, back, we're back to that same question of education before you make policy <laughs> Okay, well, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, following lots of different lines at the moment to see what works. Yeah, and, and, and probably that's where we are just now. You know, we're in this transition. And there's a lot of things going to be generated. We're going to have Betamax tapes and VHS tapes, and one of them is going to survive and Betamax is not. That's probably the world we're in just now. Okay, that, that's great. Um, sorry, Willie, did you have a chance to talk about hydrogen? No, I, th I was going to say, I, I tend to agree, although I think it, it goes back to what I was saying before, uh, it's, it probably will remain, I think, um, one of the solutions. So I guess where you're, um, well, I, I guess the key, the key sort of, let's say, area that we need, if, what we're focusing on now or where the focus needs to be is on, on the 
effectively the abatement though, or energy. So, you know, where we're producing it and we're basically just dumping it. So, so we need to look at form. So I guess it's, it's power to X, I guess is the, is the term to, uh, to use, but, but I think for hydrogen, you know, in, in sort of large industrial clusters, um, you know, there's a potential use there. And I guess the other thing is, 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 is going from the other concern with hydrogen, I suppose, is, is, is how you transport it as, as well. I mean, you know, uh, using it for sea transportation, but in that case, it's, it's maybe like, you know, looking at converting it to ammonia and then I guess you're back to, to hydrogen. So I guess there is, well, as the guys are saying, it, it's not necessarily the most efficient, certainly the, at the moment. I mean, the cost, or the unit cost of producing it, particularly if you're looking at electrolysis, it's it's really high. So I mean, at the moment, I guess the the main method of producing it is from um, steam method, uh, methane reforming. So, so yeah, there's a lot, there's a lot of what to do, but again, it's just one part of the the jigsaw. Yeah, it'll it'll fit into the jigsaw somewhere. But not in such a big uh, area as with some people think. Yeah, I think. Well, probably just the last comment on that. I think it's it's probably getting again. It's one of these things. Again, if you look, look at the media side of things or that, it, it's probably one of the things that's maybe getting more airtime than it should. So, so people are pinning more hope on it as as being yeah. the the sort of uh, panacea. But it's just one of many. Um, solutions and I think the experts that's working in this field would probably tell you that as well you know they they absolutely recognize it's it's not going to be the the one solution it's just one of many yeah agreed agreed I think that's true about many of these okay well let's move on we've got a a question here about the our uh, comparison of LNG uh, um, liquefied natural gas or piped gas from the North Sea so the question is, does this take into account the move to electric motors powered from renewable sources to drive the compressors, which the gas turbine traditionally used for this application? Um, I don't know the answer to that. That's a specific question. And does anyone have any idea whether there's electric power from renewable sources in places like Kuwait, where there's lots of gas? <laughs> not, not the moment. Although it's 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 uh, I think for that number that was put up is almost certainly the, the conventional compression. Yeah, I think that's yeah. a, that's how generalised. Uh, it doesn't go down yeah. into the detail. Okay. Yeah. Well, the Neon project they are looking to do exactly that. Okay. Which is the um, the Saudi Arabian uh, ammonia project. Okay. Uh, instead of transporting hydrogen, they're transporting ammonia, uh, and that's looking at uh, that's all all the renewable energy solar driven. So uh, creating uh, green ammonia, which of course being pumped rather than compressed, but it's um, it's it's still all you know, the whole the whole chain is is green on that basis. Yeah. Okay. So uh, we've got a, a wee bit of feedback here. This is this is good. Um, I'll just read it out. My son has an air source heat pump uh, in the nine-year-old house, so the house should be right up to modern specifications. To put it mildly, it is rubbish and very expensive to run. At a recent webinar, the expert said units sold up to 10 years ago are indeed not good. All very well for the damage, but poorly designed, poorly installed systems is is fitted and done. And I think that's, uh, but again, we're getting bad press from that. There's a lot of people, I saw, I saw a figure saying that if you can take your... A hot water boiler down to 55 degrees and you can live with that then an air source heat pump will work with your house but I know that I put mine up to 70 degrees this winter so yeah. that, that pretty much says it all really it's also the age of the house or older houses oh I think yeah pre-1970s uh, that, um, yeah I'm in a 200 year old house and I'm trying to fit insulation yeah. anytime I take a wall down <laughs> it's still cold. <laughs> okay, so that was that was some great feedback there. Um, let me just get rid of that one. And we've got one other point here. Could you put this into perspective? At the current rate, will net zero 2050 goals be achieved by government legislation and business drives alone? In far short, will we be based on current projections? How far short will we be? On based on current projections? That's a fine question. 
So, any ideas on making a prediction of the future, gentlemen? <laughs> well, if, you, if you look at, sorry, it's Wally here. Um, it depends what metric you're looking at, but I think, well, if you look at, again, uh, quote and recent uh, media, uh, well, the BBC, uh, they, they were estimating that in terms of the temperature rise, I guess, if so, so looking at that metric or optic, uh, they were suggesting that we might even be there before the end of this decade and I guess temperature rise in terms of 2050, they were saying it could be as high as, you know, uh, uh, 2.9 uh, degrees Celsius. So, so I guess uh, in there, you know, there's, there's probably, um, like I say, it, it's probably being, in, well, possibly inflated. I guess it's, it's, it comes back to personal opinion maybe and, and the information you're relying on, but, but I guess at the moment, the, the current rate or, or the current position is they would suggest that we're not doing enough. And that's that maybe is the case. Um, but right. where it sits, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. I don't I don't think we're doing enough, to be honest. No. And, and the, thing that, the thing that came out of, you know, there was a couple of slides there. And, and you picked up on it, Simon. Nuclear is shrinking. Why is nuclear shrinking? Any idea why? You know, because there was one time the great white hope. Well, the, the Germans have taken 15 nuclear reactors, no, 17, I think, nuclear reactors out of service in the last five years uh, yeah. because of Fukushima. Is that Fukushima, uh, is it? That's Fukushima related. Uh, both the UK and the US have not invested heavily in new nuclear for some time. The UK is, of course, starting again, so it's the US on the smaller scale, well, it's that smaller scale, bigger country. But, um, so th there's definitely been a lag in investment in nuclear from a lot of countries. That's certainly the case. I, I, I'm, I'm more optimistic, I've got to be honest. I think we will hit the 2050 goal. <clears throat> and that's only because of the uh, unknown unknowns. Technology yeah. has, a, has a habit of making a fool of ourselves. A fool of us. And I, and I, and I think that's going to happen because I think things like, things like SMRs, things like solid state batteries, uh, things like improved efficiency in fuel and um, solar cells, uh, you know, all, the, all this technology is going to fusion potentially. I mean, there should be a working fusion reactor in 2024. Yeah, Anything fusion seems a big thing. Um, so it, it's happened in the past. I think I strongly suspect it will happen again. I think things will suddenly start moving a lot more quickly. And it would be because of technology. We don't even know that. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, technology. Well, I guess technology <clears throat> evolution is well, we've seen it in the past. Like you said, in the past, it'll, it'll be, it's not a linear relationship. It'll be exponential. So, and I guess, again, going back, to the very start of the presentation here, and we're talking about the, I guess, let's say the influence of the UK that can have on the, well, globally. I I, I think people are sitting up and, and taking notice. I mean, I, again, I suppose in the media, I keep going back to that, but that's where people, uh, you know, get most of their information. I think, I think what they need to be careful with is, you know, if they, if they overplay the climate, crisis and and people are seeing certain you know things day to day uh, I, I or certain changes day to day you, you know and, and or, or certain things not happening i think that they become skeptical so so it starts to work against them so but i guess when you look at like i say globally now i think there is a major industry um you know grown out of all of this and i think the other thing is you know, and, and certainly if you look at oil and gas, I, I, in my career, I, I feel looking back, I don't know, 20 odd years, we were very much almost siloed. Whereas I think now we're beginning to talk about things or, or, or people are beginning to understand things in terms of energy supply and demand and, and where that energy is coming from. So I, you know, I, I'm an optimist. I think it's, I think it's great. I think the, the challenge that we've, we've probably got um, you know, we've not spoken really about uh, the the workforce and and where that workforce is going to come from in the in the future. That's the challenge, I think, is that you know, people. Well, being blunt, people need to wake up and realise that oil and gas is still going to, you know, it's still a major contributor of energy needs in the future. I think fifty percent in twenty fifty potentially. I, I mean, uh, initial projections were 
estimating that that would be lower or should be lower to meet the targets. But nonetheless, it's still in the in the mix. But we need, you know, we need the smart minds working right across the energy spectrum. So the challenge for us is, I think, is getting through to the younger generation. I mean, people that are 10 years away from leaving school, you know, getting them interested and, and, and getting them um, bought into, well, one, it's great to have a career in engineering and two, they can be part of that solution in the future. Agreed, agreed. I think that's that's very, very important. So um, thinking about yeah. how we educate, bring on the next generation, I think that's going to be the subject of one of the, the future webinars. So that's a nice little uh, continue on there. So uh, look, we've got one other comment here. I'll just, I'll just read that one out while we've got it. Um, so in the Skidmore report, the government response states that there's a goal of 600,000 heat pumps installed per, per year by 2028. And uh, how's that going to happen if there's not the best solution for heating the home? So that's another observation from the, the Skidmore report. 600,000 heat pumps per year. Um, I do know of one heat pump system that, that actually I have seen working. <laughs> And that is a ground source heat pump. Uh, the air has got limited. You know, if your air is at minus one degree <coughs> in Aberdeen, you're going to really struggle to make your heat pump work at all. But if it's uh, a ground source heat pump, it is much more efficient. So maybe that's the way we want to sort of look. drill a small borehole and start doing the heat vertically. I know that starts getting into your area um, of, Simon, of... Uh, Geothermal. Well, um, possibly not. It's, it's more, it's more uh, John Clegg's area, to be honest. Oh, sorry, John Clegg's area. Yes, yeah. yes, he, he's the expert in that. There is, um, uh, I think it's Octopus Energy, have actually taken over the Cardington Airship Sheds, the, the old building research institute. And they're putting a lot of money into, into air source heat pumps. Uh, they've built examples of different builds of homes, houses from, from the 1960s, 70s onwards. Uh, to try and optimise the design of, of heat source pumps to uh, heat source pumps that, that go with them. But um, as a previous commenter has noted, that the reputation is not great. Um, the the thing the back. Sorry, Sam. I was just going to yeah. jump in there. The, the, I guess the the other thing with that is, as soon as you, well, the problem with geothermal is it comes back to cost again. It's much more expensive to drill a borehole, but but the borehole is by far the best option as far as that goes because you don't have to go very deep where you know where your sort of thermal gradient is is pretty consistent and you'll find it's you know consistent throughout yep. the the whole year it's not affected yep. uh, it's not affected by you know the, the time of year or, or the surface temperature so it's definitely the for that type of technology it's probably the the most reliable in terms of heat source but i think the problem we um heat pumps at the moment it's just the it's the reliability you know so when people are looking for their let's say return on investment or you know people speak about payback period it's it's easy to take the the cost of the unit in isolation but i i don't think again it depends on the environment where it's uh, installed so you know my <laughs> some of you'll probably know from my accent i'm actually from orkney so i know of people up there where it's a uh, well, let, let's say it's probably more of a marine environment, so it's so it's a, a harsher atmosphere, and and a, a number of the pumps are failing prematurely. So oh, I mean, there's okay. there's a so I mean it's costing a lot more than what they expect. And I, I don't know the comment earlier on, I I, I couldn't comment on that, but it, you know it's probably on the actual running costs as well. So yeah, yeah, the whole thing needs to be taken into account. Yeah, yeah, okay. Okay, well, we've got five minutes left, so we'll get one or two more questions in. I, I want to uh, tackle this next one because I think there's a wee bit of an issue here. Uh, I'll just read it out first. There seems to be suggestions that the UK has surplus electrical supply. Hmm, okay. Shouldn't we see this at much lower energy costs, which could simulate homeowners' businesses to invest in technology to maximise electrical use rather than heat for gas for heating? 
hot water steam generation. Okay, so there seems to be two things in there. Uh, I'll probably tackle this one and let the other team come in. So first of all, there seems to be a suggestion that the UK has a surplus of electrical supply. Yes, in Scotland, we have surplus electrical supply. There is a deficit in London where we need electrical supply, but there are no cables connecting the one to the other. So we're generating a whole bunch of wind power and we've got planning permission in for a whole bunch of uh, wind turbines and offshore wind turbines, but we simply cannot get the electricity to where it is needed because the uh, national grid is not up to it. You may notice as you drive around the country, there's lots of teams out putting two wires where there used to be one wire on the pylons. Everything is being updated, everything's being increased, and the price of our bills are going up to pay for that. So there's a big electrification issue on. Second part of that, shouldn't we see this in much lower energy costs? Now, just because the uh, electricity generator generates lots of electricity doesn't mean he sells it to us for a cheaper cost. The price of electricity is tagged to the gas price. And that was the subject of another survey, but uh, uh, another seminar, and it's quite expensive. Uh, the price is uh, kept high because of the gas price, not for the cost of the production of electricity. Uh, who would like to dive in there on that one? <laughs> Patrick? Um, certainly. I do. O overall, we have nowhere near as enough electricity generation capacity compared to what we'd need to get to net zero. Yeah. And I don't think people really appreciate just how much more we need to completely re replace all of fossil fuel of power sources for vehicles, for heating, and then to be able to have enough surplus left over to provide sufficient storage to cover for three or four weeks in January with no wind and very little solar. Yeah. Yeah, we need a backup. We need batteries or energy storage systems or dams or whatever. Okay. And uh, Willie, any subject on that? The price of electricity or the surplus electrical supply? Uh, well, I think the energy market needs to change. I think you did an excellent presentation on that last year that you've just uh, touched on. So, yeah. and that's the problem. It, it is tagged to the gas price. Um, but I guess the other thing, well, my personal opinion is there's there's a couple of solutions uh, to it. I mean, there's there's one that we yeah we do need to rewire the grid. And I mean, what you'll also find is at the moment um, that the uh, the Crown Estate um, off the national grid, they're all struggling to meet the demand in terms of uh, consenting, uh, getting through the consenting process to get new uh, installed capacity connected into the grid. So that that's another thing. And I think a few... Um, you know, if you, I think one of the figures I saw was that it used to be they would maybe have, um, I think, let's say it was 10 applications annually for a, a new connection into the grid. And now there's a, about a thousand. So, you know, if you look at uh, Scotland, uh, Intog as well to some extent, and all these various different, um, I, I, I guess, companies uh, trying to, to plug in and supply that energy, it's, you know, we've got a massive huddle to overcome there so again like i say it's the energy market and it's and it's all of the i i, I suppose i was going to say the uh, the plumbing it's not really plumbing it's electrical <laughs> uh, but, so yeah there's a there's a big complicated jigsaw to try and solve here a big <clears throat> complicated jigsaw that's just the right place to leave this presentation we've now run out of time time ladies and gents so um I'll come, call a close. Simon, thank you very much for your presentation. Patrick, for uh, being part of the team. Willie, Willie Tullach, being part of the team. So, yeah, if you want to learn a bit more about uh, this, 
please watch the rest of the presentations which we're going to be producing on this subject. And uh, thank you very much all for attending today. It's now one o'clock. Thank you. Thanks, Steve.